Hey guys, it's Coach Sane here, and in this video we're going to be discussing sensors and how we're going to use them to make our programs much more efficient and capable in EV3 classrooms. So if you have the Spike Prime programs and the Robot Innovators programs, as always, the content that we discuss is going to be essentially the same, so you don't have to worry too much about that. Okay, so we're going to cover three different types of sensors that we're going to use. So before we begin, let's define briefly what sensors actually mean. So sensors for the robot are exactly the same as our human sensors that we have uh, in real life. So we're first going to discuss the touch sensor. So the touch sensor, like our hands and fingers, can uh, feel touch. So there are two states that the touch sensor can calculate, and that's pressed and not pressed. Just like if I was to touch my hand, and I can say, okay, now I'm touching my hand. No, I'm not touching my hand. So this is going to pick up some information that we're going to use to do other stuff. So the next one we're going to discuss is this light or color sensor here. So the reason why I've given it two names, light and color sensor, is because it can actually calculate two different types of things. The first one is color. So if we put it over a black colored object, it'll just, it'll be able to discern that that is a black color. Uh, if we put it over red, green, blue, white, these are all colors that this can pick up. So I think there are seven colors, uh, including brown, as well as a few other colors that it can pick up. So that's going to be very useful over the EV3 map. As you can see, it's quite colorful. The other thing that this color sensor can pick up is light, which is why I'm going to refer to this mainly as a light sensor. So light is very different to color. In fact, just to briefly explain what light is, we're going to go a bit more in depth when we actually discuss the programming. Light is essentially, it'll send out a signal and that signal will return. Naturally, this sensor will pick up how much light will become reflected. So if you put it over a black object, black absorbs light, which means 0% should ideally be reflected back up, which is why if it calculates 0% reflection, it'll know, okay, I'm over a black line. Now, if it's over a white, you'll know that white actually reflects 100% of light in ideal cases. So if it's over white, it'll pick up 100, it'll say, okay, now I'm over white. So this reflection value is going to be very important and we'll discuss it more in detail. However, it's not that difficult to understand. All you need to remember is that black will absorb 100% of white, which means it will reflect 0% back to the EV3 uh, color sensor or light sensor, which means it'll have a zero to maybe even 20 to 30 uh, value. And that'll, that will be black. And white reflects 100% of light. So if it's reading a very high value, like 80 to 100, that's why it'll pick up a 100. Now you might, you might be asking, why did I say zero to 30 and 80 to 100? And in reality, black and white values aren't really black or perfectly white, which is why we're going to have very small values like 20, 10, and zero for black, and very high values, like anything upwards of 65 is definitely going to be white. And we can only, with black, with this reflected light intensity, we only cover black and white. So you don't need to worry about blue, green, all of those intensities. That's what we're going to use color for. Uh, and in other scenarios, we're going to be using black and white, which is reflected light intensity. The last sensor we're going to cover is this gyro sensor here. Now, gyro sensor is short for gyroscopic sensor, which is way too complicated and it just it confuses students. So we're just going to call this a gyro sensor. And a gyro sensor, in reality, what this calculates is the angle. Now, it doesn't calculate the angle inherently. What it does is it calculates how fast something is turning, um, and that's called angular velocity. It then integrates that over time to calculate the angle. However, you don't need to know any of that nonsense until you get up until you know, you're 10, you're 11, you're 12, you understand what integration is, and you'll be doing physics. So you can, for now, just understand that this sensor can calculate angle. And this is quite essential, right? Because if we want to do two perfect 90 degree turns, this gyro sensor is going to allow us to do that. It's also going to allow us to keep us on the straight path, right? Because if we're going straight, it's going to be on one fixed angle. If it deviates from the angle, this gyro sensor will be able to pick up that error. So this is why this gyro sensor and this color sensor are going to be very important when it comes to future programs. This touch sensor, you can get creative with certain things you'll do with it, and that's why we've included it in this video. However, um, we found that with FLL experience, this touch sensor isn't very essential. However, you have four ports on your EV3 and it's going to be you know, your choice to choose which sensor you go up to. Just to briefly discuss the EV3, we've covered motors. So you would know that motors go into letters. So we can see A, B, C, and D, and all of my motors, like this one and this one here, are plugged into that these letters. So if you flip over to the other side, you can see there are sensors. And these sensors are labeled, if we can get that to focus, 
one, two, three, and four. So one is there, it's covered by a wire, two is there, three, and four. So something essential that you have to understand is that sensors can only go into numbers and ports for motors can only go into letters. And that's why in our programming, we're going to refer to port one, port two as sensors and port A, port B, or port B and port C as motors. So that's another important thing we need to understand before we begin. Now, another important thing you have to understand is that these sensors by themselves cannot do anything. They give us additional information from the robot. So after that initial information, then we're going to do something. And that's mainly we're going to be consisting of movement. Um, another thing you have to understand is that to use these sensors, you have to put them in the flow control tab. That's why we discussed the flow control in the previous video. And now we're going to use the flow control tab quite extensively in this video. Okay, so now let's head over to the computer and explain the census tab in EV3 Classrooms. Okay, so I'm in EV3 Classrooms and the first thing I'm going to want to do is always set your BNC motors and set to hold position at stop. This is going to be your first two blocks. Uh, you may have noticed in my previous videos, I haven't outwardly discussed it. However, this two have always been my first two blocks because this is what you're going to do to set up and initialize your motors. Okay. So the census tab is actually this light blue one here. It's quite a nice color. However, it can be a little bit bright. Um, so we're going to first discuss, discuss the touch sensor. So just to briefly go over this, there are actually a bunch of sensors that EV3 has provided. In fact, there's another sensor called the ultrasonic sensor as well as the infrared sensor. Now the ultrasonic sensor can be used for FLL purposes. However, we found that it's not that accurate and so that's not gonna be covered in this video. If you do want to discuss it, I'll leave a link to certain documentations that can help you find out what that can do. Uh, another sensor is the infrared sensor, which is not technically allowed in FLL because what that allows you to do is control the robot with a remote control. Um, that can be quite fun, but once again, we're explicitly using this for FLL purposes, which is why we're only going to cover the first three sensors. And as you can see, these sensors have nice little shapes around them or pictures. So this picture refers to the color or light sensor. This one here refers to the touch sensor. That one there is the ultrasonic sensor, which isn't going to be covered. All of this here is the infrared sensor, which also isn't going to be covered. And then these last ones here are the gyro sensor. Uh, we also have these button ones here. And what that controls is the EV3 brick buttons. So in the previous video, we discussed how to use those brick buttons. Um, we're not going to be using them because we don't really use them as sensors because they're dependent on us touching it, much like the touch sensor. So that initially already makes our work in half, right? Because we don't have to discuss any of this ultrasonic stuff. We're not going to use it or any of this infrared stuff. So let's begin by discussing the touch sensor. So the touch sensor is quite simple. There's only two blocks. Um, the first one is wait until the touch sensor is pressed which all that will do is once we touch it, then something else will happen. The next one it will do, and this is the more important one, is touch sensor one pressed. That asks a question. And if you remember, a question always leads to a decision, which is why we're going to be using that in conjunction with the flow control tab. So let's go over and let's go over to this repeat until, right? I'm just gonna create a random program and we're going to show what it does. So I've got my touch sensor plugged into port two. And then we're just going to do something very simple and we're going to maybe just turn on the spot. So let's move that. Let's change that to 20 and negative 20. So let's discuss what this program actually does. So the first two blocks, we know that's very simple. We don't have to go over that. The next one is we have a repeat loop. So, and we've chosen our own custom loop exit condition. Um, in fact, it's quite simple to understand. We're going to repeat this movement, which is one wheel forward, one wheel backwards, a turn, until the touch sensor two is pressed. So it's just going to be doing donuts on the spot, quite slow donuts. And then once we touch the sensor, it's then going to stop moving. And in fact, what we also need to add is this stop moving block here. Uh, in previous videos, um, sometimes this isn't necessary because the robot intuitively knows how to stop. but uh, in this video, we're going to need to stop moving and to tell the robot to once I've touched that touch sensor, exit out of this loop and then stop moving. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so as you can see, that was quite simple, not too much to understand. And that's the touch sensor in a loop, uh, in a nutshell. Um, and we've used that in a loop. You can also use it by itself. So wait until the touch sensor is pressed. 
However, that's not going to be very important. You can forget about that block. In fact, you can forget about the touch sensor in general unless you use it. Um, if you do use it, you have to use it for an explicit purpose, right? You have to choose your sensors wisely. You only have four ports. And you can use four color sensors if you want. There's nothing stopping you from that. Or you can use three color, one gyro, which is quite a common um, separation of ports. So the touch sensor isn't very favorable. Now let's move on to the gyro sensor. So as we discussed, the gyro sensor calculates angle. So what we're going to do, and this is going to be quite an important program. So I'll take my time to explain this. We're going to go again and pull out a repeat until. And then what we're gonna to wanna to do is go to this operators tab. So I briefly discussed this operators tab in the previous video. However, I'll go over, go over it again. And you're only gonna to wanna to consider these seven blocks here. The first four are math blocks, which means they will do math for us. Um, so there's addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So you can choose any two numbers, you can plug them in. You can use EV3 classrooms as a calculator if you want. Um, that's not very useful because you have your own calculators. But we're going to want to do math in future videos and we'll see how that works. The next three are more important and these are the inequality blocks. And it's going to allow us to control greater than, equal to, or less than conditions. So this is best explained through an example. So let's go ahead and pull out a greater than block. I'm going to change that to 90, which we will understand why in a few moments. And now let's go to the census tab. So let's scroll down to the gyro section. The gyro uh, is this shape here. It's just a square with two arrows and a circle in the middle. So, and it's essentially the same as those here. There are multiple blocks we can use. However, the one I'm going to use is this one here, gyro to angle. All this does is it calculates the angle that the gyro has calculated, right? So if we're moving and the gyro has turned this much, it'll calculate how much that has moved from its initial position. Now, it's also um, worthwhile to discuss this block here, this reset angle. What this reset angle does is when the program starts or whenever during the program, it'll reset the angle to zero degrees. Luckily, this already happens for us automatically in the program, so we can forget about this for now. Um, and these last two blocks, is the gyro greater than or less than 45 degrees? So we can choose the condition there. And the last one is wait until the gyro is certain than greater than exactly or changed more than a certain value. So these two blocks, they're not going to be very important. In fact, this block here is just an expansion upon this inequality tab, which we'll see in the future. So let's delete those two blocks and go ahead with the program we were initially going to create. So I'm going to change this to gyro2. Luckily, my gyro is already plugged into port 2, so that's that's coincidental, but it's nice. And now let's go into greater than 90 degrees. Now, repeat until the gyro is greater than or 90 degrees. So if it starts at 0 and then it moves to 90 degrees, naturally what that is is a simple turn. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out this movement tab. And we've discussed in previous videos that to do a turn, all you have to do is move one motor forward, one motor backwards, and it'll do a very efficient turn on the spot. So I'm going to change this to 20 and negative 20. In fact, let's do a faster turn, right? Let's do 50 and negative 50. We've done slow turns, so let's go faster. And after this, we're going to want to stop moving. And let's briefly explain what this program is before we run it. So all it's going to do is it's going to turn on the spot. But when is it going to stop turning? It'll stop turning once this gyro angle is greater than 90 degrees. All that is, is a 90 degree turn. Um, and as you can understand, this is much more efficient and accurate than turning for a certain amount of rotations of the wheels. So this is why we're going to be using this gyro a lot for turning. So let's see what the program looks like. As you can see, that was quite an efficient program. Uh, in fact, it was very efficient. And if we were to make a square with those turns, our square would be quite perfect, unlike the squares we used with just this block by itself. So that's the gyro in a nutshell. Okay, so that's the gyro completely. That's all we're going to do for this video. In future videos, we're going to be using the gyro to do much more creative things, like be able to go straight um, and a lot more accurate turns. So that might seem like a very accurate turn. However, there's actually a lot more we can do with it. So that's quite exciting. So watch out for those in the future videos. Okay, so that wraps up this gyro section here. The last one we're going to cover is this light sensor. Um, and the gyro and the light sensor, they're quite similar. Um, so as I discussed in the past, we're going to use this light sensor mainly to use the reflected light intensity. So just to recap what this was, reflected light intensity, essentially a signal is sent out. And this signal will either become reflected for a certain percentage. So if we're over black, 
black absorbs a lot of light. So the reflection is going to be quite minimal. It's going to be somewhere between 0 and 30% reflected. However, if we hover it over white, like my jumper here, the white reflection value is going to be quite high because white reflects a lot of light. If you didn't know that fact, now you do. Um, it's actually why if you go into like a quadrangle that has white cement, um, and if it's very sunny, especially at 12 o'clock, and the, light, the sun is completely putting the sun sunlight downwards, that light is becoming reflected in your eyes, which is why it's quite hard to see on a quadrangle on a sunny day. So, all you need to know is that we're going to be using black and white values to know where the robot is. So, let's quickly make a program to illustrate that, because that's the best way to learn. So, we're once again going to use this repeat until block. However, I'll take all of these out, because they're not going to be very useful anymore. And what I'm going to want to do is, we have this operator here, and we're going to want to change that. So Let's go and pull out this less than block. I'll explain everything that's going on. Um, slowly so all we've done is pulled out a loop uh, a repeat loop and we're going to repeat it for until a certain amount of variable has less than a certain amount of number so what is that variable well we're doing the light sensor so as you can see there's quite a lot of light values and light blocks we can use um, we'll quickly discuss this ambient light intensity it's not that important but essentially ambient light intensity is the opposite of reflected light intensity it's the light that's in the air um, and as you can imagine, that's not very accurate, right? Because the signal isn't being sent out to a direct spot. It's in the air, which is why we're rarely going to use ambient light. The, ne the next one here is color. So as we discussed in the side of the video, we can also use this light value as a color sensor. So the colors we can use, uh, as you can see, it can detect red, white, green, yellow, white, brown, blue. I repeated white twice. That's fine. Um, and that's color in a nutshell. We're not going to be using color very often either which is why we come to this tab here. So all of these four blocks, they calculate reflected light intensity, which is what I've been discussing. So a light signal is sent out. If it's black, which absorbs a lot of light, it's going to be quite a low percentage that's reflected. So we'll see a very low percentage on the screen and we'll know that. Uh, if a high light intensity is being reflected back, that means we're on more of a white surface. And we're only gonna use that two colors, white and black. You might be asking, why don't we just use this red uh, and instead change that to white and black to know where we are. You can do that, however, reflected light intensity is a lot more accurate with this color sensor than um, the color sensor's white and white, white and black ability to detect those colors. So that's why we're going to be using reflected light intensity most of the time. So the block I'm going to be using here is this one here. Unfortunately, I have to change this to four. That's not too much of an issue. If you don't change your port, the program won't run. So be sure to make sure all of your ports are correct. So we can see here we've created this, this color sensor in plugged into number four. The reflected light intensity is less than 100. Now, my program that I'm going to want to explain is we're going to have a black line and the robot's going to travel. And once it reaches that, tra once it reaches that black line, I'm going to ask the robot to stop. So a black line is quite a low intensity. I've calculated my black light intensity to be 20. You can calibrate that yourself. All you have to do is hover the robot over the black line or the white line and go into port view and you'll see the value of intensity that it reflects back and whatever that value is that's when we're going to know that it's over a black line so repeat until the reflected light intensity is less than a certain number and in our case it's going to be 20. so we're going to want to move forward um, because we're going to want to repeat this uh, forward until that happens so let's pull a forward block out and we're just going to want to move straight at 50 speed i'll use this one instead they're the same block as we discussed in the first video, it doesn't really matter. And we're going to want to go slow. So there are two things we have to discuss before we run this program. In fact, there are three things, right? The first one isn't very hard. We have to stop moving after a certain value. So always remember your stop moving blocks. The next thing we have to discuss is why is this less than? Why can't we just be equal to? And the answer to that is we want to maximize the opportunity for the robot to stop. If it's just on 20, sometimes there might be other factors that uh, affect the light value. So if it reads 19 instead of 20, then the robot won't stop if this was gone, reflected light intensity is equal to 20, right? So that's why we just have 20 as the maximum value. If it's anything less than that, we know we're on black and we're always going to stop. So this less than 20 value is going to be much more accurate than an equal to 20 value. The last thing we have to discuss is why I've chosen such slow speeds. Now, if you're traveling at 100 speed, there's a high chance that your light value is not going to be able to pick up 
that black line. That's why you, whenever you're trying to find the black line, we're going to want to stop. And that's this program in a nutshell. Let's see what it looks like. So as you can see, all it did, it moved forward. Once it saw that black line, it stopped. So that's essentially the robot having its own eyes, right? Because you can think about it like, if you see a black line and you want to stop at that, you'll see that black line, you go to it and you notice it's a black line and you'll stop. The robot now effectively has its own eyes, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit scary, but it's okay, we're in control of the robot. You don't have to worry about any artificial intelligence with EV3 classrooms, we don't going to go into any of that. Okay, so that's the robot finding the black line. You might be thinking, okay, what if we want the robot to find the white line? And that's what we're going to do in the next example. So what I'm gonna to wanna to do is pull out a, I'll take this out actually, and we're going to do a forever block, and then we're going to repeat until, we'll put this back in here, actually we'll do an if and else statement. I'm creating this program quite quickly, but we'll explain it after I've created it. Uh, I'm going to repeat until this value is here, the reflected light is less than 20. Then we're going to move forward. <coughs> then we're also going to do another situation. Repeat until the reflective value is greater than a certain number. Okay, and then we're going to want to repeat until again. And we're going to do greater than the reflected light intensity. So let's put out this block here. <coughs> and change that to port 4. And we'll move at positive 20 and 20 speed. Okay, so I very quickly created this program and now let's discuss what it does. So there are a couple of new things here. The first one is this forever loop. We'll discuss that forever loop a little bit later, but let's discuss inside this forever loop. There are two repeat until loops or custom loop exit loops. So the first one we have here is this reflected light intensity less than 20 degrees and move forward until you see a reflected light of less than 20, which as we know is a black line. So there's nothing new here. The next one we've discussed is this repeat until reflected light intensity is greater than a value. And this value here, it's going to repeat this until it finds a white line, which is why I've got it greater than a certain value. And my value is, my white value is going to be about 65 degrees, uh, sorry, 65%. That's why I've got it greater than a certain white value, which is going to be about 65%. So whenever you're trying to find a black line, you're going to go less than a very low value, like 20. If you're trying to find a white line, you're going to greater than a high value, like 65. And once again, if you want to move forwards, we're going to use negative power because that's what my robot is on. And backwards is going to be 20. So let's see what this program looks like. Okay, so as you can see, that was a pretty cool illustration of the color sensor, but if you didn't understand what was going on, I'll explain the program once again. So, as you can see, it moved forward until it saw the black line. Once it saw the black line, it then moved back until it saw the white line. And I continuously moved that tape around just to show you that it was going to continuously move back until it saw that white or black line. So the only thing that was depending on its decision making was the color sensor value. And to program this, all we did was we repeated that forever, right? That's where this forever now it makes sense because we were going to continue that program over and over again and I actually stopped that with the brick button. So we could have changed this to four times and it would have found a black line, forward, white line, backwards, black line, forward, white line, backwards, and done that four times. And we repeated it forever just for the sake of it. The next thing we did was we then moved the robot forward at negative 20 and 20 speed and we did that until it saw the black line. Now, to see the black line, we calibrated the reflect light intensity to be less than a certain percentage. So that's why we see here, this light intensity of port four is going to be less than 20. It knew it was over that black line. So once it was over that black line, it then stopped this loop 
I went back into this loop here. Now this one, it went backwards now, right? Because it's had a different, it's had a different uh, sign. The first one was negative, the next one's positive, which means it's going to go in the opposite direction. And when did this opposite direction movement stop? It stopped once it saw a light value of greater than 65 degrees, 65 percent, sorry. So that 65 percent corresponds to a white line in my room. So as you can see, all it did was it went forward until it saw the black line, stopped, went backwards until it saw the white line, stopped forwards, back, forwards, back. And all that was stopping its movement was the black and white lines. So as you can see, that's quite powerful because now the robot can see black and it can see white. Um, and these are the two main colors that we're going to use to do a certain amount of things. So we can do line scoring with the certain uh, black and white lines. We can also do line following. So those two videos will be discussed in the future. So this was just an illustration of how to use the light value and to find black and white lines. You can also use it to find color, that's quite simple. Just like we did with the black and white lines, you can just choose a color like red. So move forward until you see red, move backwards until you see green. However, we found it a lot more accurate to just use the black and white lines on the um, FLL maps. So just to recap the whole video, we discussed three types of sensors. We quickly, we quickly went over the touch sensor, which is quite a simple sensor, it just feels uh, touch. The next one we discussed was this gyro sensor, which is a little bit more complicated, but it's very useful. It calculates angle, right? Um, and I quickly briefed over the fact that it calculates angular velocity and then integrates that over time to calculate the angle. However, you don't really need to understand that. All you need to know is that this thing can calculate angle. The next sensor we discussed was this light sensor or color sensor, and we use it to calculate light, which is why I'm going to refer to it as a light sensor from now on. So this light sensor can pick up where it's going and when it can see a black or a white line. A black line refers to a very low percentage reflection, such as 20 to 0, and a white line refers to a very high percentage of reflection. So something above 65 is definitely going to be white. You might be thinking, what's the in-between? Like, is it between black and white? We're going to use that value, which is somewhere between 25 and 40 for line following, and that's going to be something we discuss in future videos. So that's sensors in a nutshell. We use them to create various programs just to explain what they do. You don't really need to understand it at this point. However, in the future videos, we're going to be using sensors to create quite complex programs. So if you have any sort of um, gaps in your understanding, rewatch this video, and I guess I'll see you guys in the next one.